Hey everyone, in this course we're going to be making a shooter RPG in Godot. The game was made with teaching in mind, so many areas of it, like this character select screen, were only fleshed out enough to give you an idea for what it would look like in the game. Being a shooter, you have movement and rotation controls, and of course shooting. And being an RPG, you have different abilities that you can use, and you have stats, and you'll fight monsters and get experience. So as we go through this world, you'll see different monsters spawn here, and some of them have different AI, so they might move toward you or away from you, or shoot near you instead of exactly where you are. And that's it, that's the foundation for this game. The game is free, and I urge you to check it out. The link is here, and I'll also include it below in the description. And the reason why I think you should check it out is because practically everything that's in the game is covered in this course to some extent. This video, though, is only going to talk about the basics. We're going to talk about design fundamentals of Godot, getting started, getting everything set up, differentiating between scenes and nodes. And by the end of this video, you'll have the character select screen. And even though we'll talk about sprites, you'll just be able to see something like this at the end of you chose Archer or Mage. As this course goes on, we'll get more and more script heavy. So we'll start to deviate from Godot into just GD script. And we'll talk about things like design patterns and refactoring. And we'll even touch on topics related to game development like linear algebra. Godot itself is free both to download and to distribute with your game, and they don't take a cut of your profit. Installing it is really just downloading a zip file from this link and extracting it, so I won't show that in this video. But I do want to talk about this getignore.io site. If you're ever using any new technology or language or framework like Godot, and you don't know what your foundational .getignore file should be, this will produce it for you. And that formed the only get ignore that I ever had. I don't think I ended up ignoring anything else. But Godot doesn't want you checking in things like .import to your repository. So that's nice to know and to have. And then the folder structure is the last thing I wanted to show here. And this is what I did. These are just conventions. They're not required by the editor. So I have an assets folder with things like fonts and sprites underneath. And then you can see that get ignore that I have here too. Just a couple of quick notes before we get started. If I ever use keyboard shortcuts, you'll see them show up here on the screen. I am on Windows, so they might not be the same on your operating system. But regardless, I'll try to show you how to access something through the interface rather than just using keyboard shortcuts right off the bat. This is also somewhat dense material, and I cover it a little bit quickly. I prefer that you have to slow down the video rather than having filler content that you have to speed up. So there are controls on the screen right now if you're watching through YouTube of how you can slow down the video or pause. Let's get started. If you open up Godot, you'll see this new project dialog, and I'm gonna just type in Godot video code here, and we can pick a folder and click create. This is all pretty straightforward. At the bottom though, they say to pick a renderer, and they've got some description on how you can choose and that you can always change it later. I will point out that for this particular course, if you pick OpenGL ES 2.0 and you do a web export, so very specific steps, you'll see these lines in between tiles that if you picked 3.0, you wouldn't see. So I suggest just picking 3.0 for the sake of this course and click create and edit and it'll launch the editor. Godot's whole design philosophy revolves around scenes, which we can see up here now. What Godot suggests in their official documentation is to take everything that is visible in your game. So for example, enemies, projectiles, the world map, the interface itself, and those things will likely turn into scenes. And sure enough, if we look at the finished code for this game, we can see that. There are scenes for Archer and Bat, so those are characters. There are scenes even for particle effect. And then I know I said visible to the player, but I even have a scene here for music. So it's really anything that the player can sense. Make your first scene by choosing 2D scene on the left side here, and you immediately see some changes to Godot. For one, it added a node 2D on the left. In the middle, it changed from 3D to 2D, because we're in 2D, we made a node 2D. And on the right side, we see the inspector is now showing us properties of the selected node. Nodes are the building blocks of Godot, and it's how we form these scenes. So right now, all we have is something like a transform and a z-index here, but we could add a sprite and we'll see different properties there, and we could add a particle system and we'll see different properties there. Now, you don't need to do this on your own editor right now, but I wanted to show you how this is working. There is an inheritance hierarchy for every node that we have. So a node 2D inherits from canvas item, which inherits from node. We see that same hierarchy reflected over on the right side. Node 2D inherits from canvas item, which inherits from node. Let's flesh out our simple scene by adding a sprite. If you click the plus button at the upper left, you'll be able to search through this list. And this is generally how I do it. I don't like to find the path to that object that we're trying to add. I like to just type at the top. So I type in sprite. And we now have a sprite in our scene, but we can't see any difference. And even if we zoom in, there's nothing there. And the reason why is that our sprite doesn't have a texture. 
So if you go over to the right side in the inspector where you can modify a node's properties, you can click load and you can actually load it through here. Godot gives you an icon by default, but I find it's easier to just drag right from the bottom left over to the upper right, and there's our sprite. A sprite inherits from node 2D, so it has its own transform, and as we drag this around, we can see the transform getting updated here. It's easiest to just drag this around. You could also type in numbers, but something that's not obvious that I want to show you is that you can do math in here. So if we say something like 20 times 5 plus 10 will be positioned at 110. One other note quickly about this is that if you ever want to revert a particular property that you modified, this undo button will let you quickly revert something. So now this sets our transform back to 0, 0. Let's add one more node in order to show the power of scene trees. Before I use this button, which if we hover over, we see it says control A. So now I'll use the keyboard shortcut, control A, and I'll type in label here, and we will add a label to the scene, and I'll give it some text, and we'll position it just like we did before. Label is a child of sprite. So that means that if I move sprite, we're actually also going to change the position of the label. This hierarchy is crucial in Godot because it will let you have something like a character with a sword and a shield that always follows its hands, or even a nameplate like what we've done here that follows your character around. The sprite and the label are also under our node 2D. So if we click the node 2D, we can drag this around as well. However, you might recall that sprite is a node 2D. So this node 2D at the beginning of our scene tree is actually redundant. We could right click the sprite and click make scene root and then just delete our node 2D and we haven't really lost any functionality now. We can still drag the sprite around, but we don't have that unnecessary node at the top of the scene tree. At any point, we can test the scene that we're working on by clicking this play scene button at the upper right. It does require that we save the scene before we test it, so I'm going to save it as just test.tscn because we're not going to keep this. And we see exactly what we saw in the editor now over in the game. However, back in the editor, you can see that scene is now split into local and remote. If we click remote, it's going to show us what's loaded in the remote version of the game. So if I change this, we see that it added a bunch of twos only to the remote version, not to the local one. And it also says changes may be lost. We've only added these here, so if I were to close this right now, these would just be gone forever. If you want them to be saved and you want to modify the remote version of the game, you can use the local tab for that. So I can change these to threes, let's say. And now when I close the scene and rerun it, we do see that those threes are maintained. So all I wanted to point out here was the distinction between the local and remote views that shows when you play the scene. I suggest at some point looking through this add child dialog and seeing what kinds of nodes you can add. So for example, if we just add a CPU particles 2D, we have a leaky nose for our sprite. But thanks to how the inspector lays everything out, we can start changing properties on this and now see that it's a teardrop instead. And if you ever need any more help, you can go into the documentation and type in your name of something and this will become especially helpful once we get into scripting to see what these properties are named and what their types are. And we'll quickly go over what we just learned. Godot has these building blocks of scenes and nodes and scenes are comprised of those nodes. They're called scene trees really because they're trees of these nodes. The nodes themselves have this inheritance hierarchy so a sprite is a node 2D which is a canvas item. There is a lot that you can do just through scenes and nodes, but you can't do everything. You're not going to be able to make a full game without scripting. And for scripting, there are four languages that are currently supported. Two are not specific to Godot, so there's C Sharp and C++, and the other two are specific. GD Script, which we'll be covering, and then Visual Script, which is this blueprint-like language where you don't need to worry so much about syntax because you're just connecting blocks here. Back to GD Script, though. For those of you who are technical, I suggest actually reading some of the notes on this slide. For those of you who are not technical, if you haven't programmed before, I think you'll still be able to follow along with this video, but I'm not going to cover the basics of programming. Things like variables, for loops, if statements. It's easier to consume code than it is to produce it, so I will explain at a high level. In fact, let me show you an example. We'll add a script to our sprite by clicking this button, just to the upper right of sprite. And again, we have to save this. This is just temporary for now, just for an example. So I'll just click Create. And Godot opens its editor with some template script for us, which I'm going to overwrite here. This is a function that Godot is going to call on every physics tick. So it's going to be called consistently, and we'll call it with the amount of time that has passed since the last invocation of this function. And what we'll do is we'll move our sprite to the right. That is roughly the level of explanation you can expect throughout this course. I'm not going to talk about things like what does func mean, or what is an argument, or what is a return value, but I will talk about the GD script specifics and how it pertains to Godot. 
So you know what this script does and you know about the play scene button. So let's test this out. And we can see that our sprite is moving very, very slowly to the right. What we also learned earlier, and I will click the maximize button here, is that we can make changes on the fly to this. So let's try multiplying delta by 10, for example. And we save that and we see that our sprite is moving 10 times faster than before. And if I do it another 10 times faster, it's going to quickly move off the screen. So what's happening here is that delta is the number of seconds that have passed since the last invocation of this function, which means that we're, we were moving originally at one pixel per second, and now we're moving at 100 pixels per second here. The reason we're even able to modify a position at all is because this particular script extends from Sprite, and Sprite has a position, which is what we saw earlier. The only other thing I want to talk about here really fast is that if you control click a function, you can see the documentation about that function, and then you can go right back to where you were in your code. I have some tips that can make editing in Godot a little bit easier for you. For one, I highly suggest that you stick to Godot's built-in editor rather than using something external like Visual Studio Code. Godot does have a feature that lets you use an external editor, but I took a bunch of notes on what I found to be problems with it, and some of these bugs have been open for a while. If you're watching this in 2022 and they're fixed, then for sure give it a shot, but if it's 2020, I suggest just sticking to the editor that you see. The other thing is that you saw me do this in the example right there. You can maximize the code editor by clicking that button at the upper right, or you can set a keyboard shortcut for it. And that gives you a lot more screen real estate to work with a code. Finally, I suggest using shortcuts and you can find these through the editor settings, but the two that I have listed here with their shortcuts on Windows are the ones that I use the most frequently, which is to quickly open a file and to quickly open a function. Now let's get back to making a character select screen. Make the character select scene by clicking this plus button at the top. And we know that our character select scene is going to be an interface, so we'll click this. You may have noticed already that there are different colors for all the different kinds of nodes. So node 2D, they're all blue. All the interface ones are green. So we're going to pull from the interface nodes and we find label here. So we'll name this one game title. And then we'll make another label here and we'll call this one instruction title and we'll make another label and we'll call this instruction body. And then I will fill out the contents over here. Unlike Node2D, label doesn't actually have a transform. Instead, it has the anchor and margin properties. And as I move the label around, we see the margin getting updated over here. What anchor represents is where relative to its parent, this thing is going to get positioned. So if we want it to be the exact same size as its parent, we could set its right and bottom anchors to one and now the only reason we see that it's offset is because the margin is doing that. So we can set this to take up the entire size of its parent and the same space as its parent. To easily control both anchor and margin, let's reset what we have right now, you can use this layout button. So if we want it at the top right or in the bottom right, we can choose those. And what this will do is, let's say we ran our scene, and I gotta save this again, so we'll save this as character select and we'll save this in the scenes folder because this one we will be saving. So I've run the game, we anchored it to the bottom right, so when I resize the window, we see that it's staying there at the bottom right. However, if I resize the label instead of the window, so for example, let's put in more contents here. You can see that it's going out of bounds here. This is actually controlled by the grow direction. The grow direction by default is set to end, which means that as the contents get bigger horizontally, they'll expand to the side, and as they get bigger vertically, they'll expand down. So instead, I could just change this to begin, and now it will expand upward. In general, you're not going to have these individual labels control their own positions. Instead, what you would do is you would add a container element. So for example, let's add a grid container, and then let's shift click to select all of these and just drag them into the container. What we saw immediately is that there is no overlap anymore. The grid container knows how to lay out the children such that they won't overlap and it knows how to compute their sizes. So if I change the number of columns to two, for example, and in this case, this isn't really a great example, but we see that there are now two columns and three, we could set it like that. By doing this, you now cannot change the position of an individual label. You see that warning at the bottom left saying children of a container get their position and size determined only by their parent. That's one of the benefits of having this container, is that the children don't have to manage that size or position. Fonts and settings aren't the easiest settings to find for labels, but the very first thing you need is a font in the first place. So let's go make an assets folder, and then underneath I'll make a fonts folder, and then I'll just paste in a true type font that I downloaded from Google Fonts. 
One thing you should definitely keep in mind is that you shouldn't be using any resources for any project that you don't have the license to. For Google Fonts, they have their license on the site, and I generally make an asset licenses.txt file or just something like this to keep track of those licenses myself. Now, when we go back to Godot, look at this bottom left panel. I haven't actually clicked the editor yet, even though I added the assets folder. And when I click over here, Godot notices that we added assets and it picks up our font that we have. With the font in our editor, we can now click one of the labels and go over to custom fonts in the inspector. Now we have a dynamic font, which is a true type font. A bitmap font would be something where you have a picture for each glyph, so the letter A, letter B, letter C. We'll choose dynamic font. And then just like with the sprite, we see that our label disappeared. A sprite needs a texture, just like how a dynamic font needs an actual font behind it. So we'll drag our font onto font data over here. And now we have our font set up. We can customize the size of it over here. We can set an outline size if we want. And then under custom colors, we can specify the font color. Let's say we want it to be red and the outline color. Let's say we want it to be blue. My goal with this course is to give you the tools to do what you need with your game. So if you want to leave this UI looking like this, that's totally fine. Or feel free to deviate from this and make it look great. But I'll give you some guidelines on how to make it look like what I at least have in that screenshot at the beginning of this video. First, we would have a grid container with just one column on it. The other thing is that this control is largely unnecessary. Just like earlier where we had a node 2D and then a sprite beneath it, if all we're going to have is this grid container, then this can be the scene route and we don't need this control anymore. Second, I would probably center all of these horizontally, and for that I would use a center container. So we can drag, for example, our game title into here, and then set its size flag so that it expands horizontally. Now the parent, the grid container, should take up the entire screen space, and now we can see that our title is centered in the screen. And we'll do this same general thing and modify font size and color and outline in order to get this to look a little bit better. The final thing I'll point out here is that there is a custom constant section in grid container that lets you specify a V separation to give these a little bit of padding. So we might set this to 30 or 50 or whatever looks good by the end of this. Once you have your UI looking the way that you want, I suggest always naming your root node of any scene something that means something to you. So for example, in this case, we're making our character select scene. So I like making the root node usually match the scene name. The reason why is because when you run this scene and it's nested really deep into the scene tree. So for example, you have a player's sword and it you have your world and then you have your player and then you have their hand and then you have their sword. You wanna know what that thing is named. And so here in our remote view, we can see the name we just assigned it. So I think that's generally a good idea. Just name your node something that makes sense. I haven't shown you how you would add buttons into your UI in case you want to click something rather than having to press a keyboard key. In order to understand how buttons work, we need to know what signals are. So first, let's start by adding a button to a new scene. We're not gonna keep any of this code for right now, so I'm just showing you this. And we will give it an icon. And so now we have something that looks like a button. And if I were to run this, we could click this, but nothing's going to happen yet. We need to use signals. Signals are events, and it's Godot's way of implementing the observer pattern. A signal is essentially the same as this node just shouting out to the world, hey, something just pressed me, or hey, a body collided with me. And if someone's out there listening, then they can act on that. So in order for someone to act on this, in our case, we're going to need a script. So let's just make a script really fast. And we'll go back to our scene and connect the pressed event. So I'll double click this. And it's saying that when the button emits this signal pressed, that we want this function to handle it. So in our case, we have the on button pressed. And I'm just going to type print clicked. Print is just a way of logging to this output down here. We need to save the scene. I'm just going to save this really quickly. And now when we click this button, we see that it's saying clicked down at the bottom. So again, what's happening here is that the button is saying, hey, something clicked me. And then we connect our signal through the editor in this case. That's what's happening here. We could also have done this through code. And then it calls our function in the end. And our function just prints out the line clicked. If what I said about signals doesn't make sense just yet, don't worry, we're going to actually write some code for it that's going to end up in the game in just a bit. But first I wanna talk about what does it even take to make a character select screen? Well, there are two parts. One is the input itself, whether you have a button that you click, whether you have a keyboard key that you press, you need some way of detecting that you chose a character. And then once you've chosen that character, we need to transition from the character select screen to the game. 
I'll talk about three methods for doing this, but I only really like this first one, and you can already see that it involves signals, so you know where we're going with this. This method is that you would have a node called main, and this node on its own is not really too concerned with much. It's just going to set up our gameplay scenes for us, and you can see that it has a script on it as well. So it starts with our character select scene as a child of it. And what we'll do is the character select scene, when you press a button on your keyboard, is going to use a signal to do something like, hey, someone just chose a character, and main will listen to that. So it will, on the character select scene, connect to that signal, and when the signal is emitted, it's going to run on character selected. That code is going to probably store a character we chose and also transition to the gameplay scene. What's nice about this method is that thanks to signals, character select itself doesn't need to know who's handling the signal. All it's concerned with is that it knows how you choose a character and it knows how to emit that signal. And then main has to know what it's supposed to do to transition to gameplay. That's what I don't like about the other methods. With method number two, and if you haven't coded before, this might be unfamiliar. It's okay if you don't follow this, you can just go with method number one. Method number two is that we have a singleton. So for example, when you've picked your character, character select needs to store what character class you've picked somewhere and then change the scene itself. So there'd have to be some singleton where you store it, and then we can call the change scene function. This is something that Godot allows for us to swap out character select with gameplay without needing any sort of manager like we had in method one with main. Unfortunately, change scene doesn't let you pass in any parameters to that scene, otherwise you wouldn't need the singleton. So what we could do is we could look at method number three, which is to avoid that singleton and basically write our own form of change scene. So what we're doing here is we're instantiating a new scene, we're initializing it, this is a function that we would write that could pass in whatever we want, again bypassing that singleton, but then we need to do the rest of change scene on our own, which is to add the scene and then remove the old one and free it. Again, we're going with method number one here, so if the other two didn't make sense, don't worry about it. We're going to add a script to our character select scene, and this time since I actually want to keep this, we are going to put this in the proper location with the right name. I tend to make a scripts folder. You don't have to do this, but I find that it helps for organization. So we'll create our script there, and then it'll automatically open up, and I'll paste in a script that I've written already. Here, what we're saying is that the character select screen can emit this signal called selected character, and when it does, it's going to have which character you selected. Makes sense so far. Then we have a function for Godot that handles input, and I'll talk about what this means in just a little bit. Remember that you can always control click and find out what it means if you look through the documentation yourself, but like I said, we'll talk about it in a bit. And what's happening in here is pretty straightforward. When you press a button, we're picking that character, and we're doing so by emitting the signal. There's a lot to break down here though. So let's start with what it means to have these digits. Godot doesn't actually know about these by default. In order to add them, you need to go to project, project settings, and then input map. And what you'll do here, and I've already added these three digits, so I'll show you with a fourth one. What you'll do is you'll add in a digit or whatever the name of your key is. You could have called these anything. I just called them digit one through three. And then you can click this plus and you can assign it to any input method you want. So if you want it to be a joystick button and you want to configure it that way, then yeah, feel free to click that and choose through the options here. But in my case, I just set it to key and then I press the key on my keyboard. And I did that three times, one for each digit. I'm not actually going to even save digit four. That was just for an example. The other thing I want to show you is about static typing here and how it's handled in GDScript. Whenever you see this colon input event or an arrow and then void, that's a static type. The way that GDScript handles these is that variables can be dynamically typed by default. So let's say you did something like this. This is dynamically typed because we didn't assign any type to it and we didn't have the editor infer it. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a sec. So what this means is that if we want to set this to the number five afterward, or we want to set it to null afterward, we can, and the editor is not going to complain. But let's say we gave it a type by default. We said that it's a string. Now this is detected as an error because we can't assign a number to a string. And if we commented this out, then this would be detected as an error because you actually can't assign null to the types in GDScript either. So let's say we didn't want to have to specify that it's a string. We could have the editor infer that with colon equals and just like before now, this knows that it's a string because it could tell at build time that the right side of this was a string. If you're new to static typing, you might ask, why do I even want this? Well, one of the big reasons is it stops you from shooting yourself in the foot. Let's say I wanted to return a value from this function. This is going to be an error as well because it knows that we're not supposed to return something from this function. So again, this lets you prevent these sorts of errors before you even run your game 
by seeing directly in the editor what types don't match. So that's one thing I wanted to point out. The other thing I wanted to point out is that by having a signal here, we don't need to couple this to our main class that we're eventually going to have. So we could have done something like this, where we have a singleton here, or we passed in main as dependency injection, and we could have called character selected, but we, we didn't need that because our signal just let us say, hey, I just selected the archer. And if main listens to us and cares about that, then it can handle it. And all that we have here is code that character select needs to know about. And let's do that same general process and make our main scene. So we're going to click the plus button here. We're going to just add a regular node at the top of this because main doesn't really show up in our scene tree. So we don't need a transform for it. It'll just be a node. And we'll name it main to make it more obvious what it represents. And we'll save this in our scenes folder. And then we'll attach a script to it. And we're going to call this main as well. Since we already have the scripts folder, we can just change this path. We don't need to make it again. And I'm going to paste in code and maximize this so that we can see everything. Let's break this script down to make it more manageable. We start with the ready function, which is what Godot is going to automatically call when this node and all of its children have entered the scene tree. And what we see happening here is that we're trying to set up the character select scene. So what this is saying is when our game starts, we want to show that character select scene. So let's go see what that does. It's going to preload the scene. And what preload does, there are two functions. There's load and there's preload. Preload is going to try at build time to load this scene. And that's why we actually have an error on line 19 because we never made gameplay.tscn yet. So it doesn't exist. But if we had typed load here, it's not going to detect that as an error yet because it doesn't try at build time to resolve that path. Paths themselves have res colon slash slash in them. And that's because everything that you have over here starts with that. That's your root folder. And this way, we don't need to worry about any operating system issues that you might have. It's always going to be res colon slash slash and then whatever path you have. So then we instantiate that scene. So now we have a concrete object of it and we add it to main. So we'll have main and then directly beneath that, we'll have character select scene. And here's where we listen for the signal that character select is emitting. And unfortunately, in GD script, functions are not first class objects. So you might wonder, why can't I just pass in a callback like this? Hey, when we get this signal, why don't we just listen and call the function? But you just can't do that right now. So maybe in the future, they'll add that. But anyway, regardless of how that's happening, it is happening. When selected character is emitted, we call into this function, which is right down here. And what's happening is we're going to remove the character select scene, and we're going to instantiate the gameplay scene and swap that in, and then call init. This is the last special thing that we have to talk about here. GD script and Godot have special constructors for instantiating a scene, so that's dot instance, and for instantiating a script, that's dot new. But when you're instantiating a scene, you can't pass in your own parameters to it, at least not in the current version of Godot. So we made our own convention here, dot init. This is not something that Godot did. We could have called this dot install if we wanted to, or dot construct. And that's going to pass in our character class to the script attached to the gameplay scene. As I said, this error on line 19 is because we don't actually have a gameplay scene yet. So let's go add one now. We won't actually be making gameplay in this video. So we're just going to make a temporary node and we'll call this gameplay. And again, because there's no gameplay, we'll just put a label so that you can tell what character class you've selected. And then we'll save this scene and we'll create a script on gameplay, the root node here and I'll just save this to the right folder. And then I'll paste in our script that we have. That happens every once in a while because I press control A. Here's our script that we have. And what this is doing is very straightforward. When this thing gets initialized, we're setting the labels text to you chose and then something like Archer or Mage. The only thing I want to point out here is this dollar sign. It is shorthand for git node and then I guess technically quotation marks as well. So these two things are exactly the same. This reference, it says label. It's not actually the type of what we're referring to. It's the name of what we're referring to. So had we called this something like class output, then in our script, we would have also called this class output. And let's say there was a button underneath it and we wanted that, we could say slash button. So you can see this is also being highlighted green here. That's because the dollar sign knows to treat the slash as a path character, not something like division. We have our setup now. We have a main scene we have character select and we have gameplay. And so this is the first time that we're not going to click this button at the upper right, play scene. We're instead going to click the play button to play our project or our game. But since we've never made a main scene, we have to pick one, which of course is going to be main. And then when our game starts up, we see our UI that we have, and I'm gonna press one on the keyboard. And so it says you chose Archer.
and I can press F5 to play the game again and choose a different one and it says you chose mage. So we've connected everything through those signals and our gameplay <laughs> is showing what we've chosen. All right, let's summarize what we've done. So we learned about scenes and nodes. I'm not gonna go over those a third time here. We learned about scripts. One thing I did not mention is that there's only one script allowed per node. So for example, our gameplay had the gameplay script. We couldn't also assign a second one. Instead, we'd either need to use composition or inheritance to get functionality from a second script. And we know about static typing now too. I highly suggest using it. It'll help you catch errors at build time. We learned what signals are and how different nodes can emit a signal so that they aren't coupled to other nodes and then the other nodes can listen for those signals and that's what main was doing to swap out gameplay and remember that this is just the first video in the course if you buy the course you'll get access to all of the code and again go to adamlearns.com for that course and you can buy all this i really hope you guys learned something watching this video thank you very much hope to see you in the second video